Well, good morning there, Tubinettos. You caught me doing a little light reading. And as I'm looking through here, I see an interesting item from the Macon, Georgia Telegraph of October 26, 1934. Big preparation made for lynching tonight. Dated Greenwood, Florida, October 26th. Local citizens had been preparing all day for the lynching of a Negro, scheduled to take place here tonight. This morning, a mob seized Claude Neal, 23, from a jail in Bruton, Alabama, where he had been held in connection with the murder of a white girl, which took place here several days ago. At noon, a committee of six representing the mob announced a timetable for the lynching, which was given in newspapers and over the radio as follows. At sundown, the Negro will be taken to the farm two miles from here, where Miss Lola Kennedy, the murder victim, lived. There he will be mutilated by the girl's father. Then he will be brought to a pig pen in the middle of a cotton field nearby, where the girl's body was found and killed. Finally, his body will be brought to Mariana, the county seat, nine miles from here, and hung in the courthouse square for all to see. The Negro was presently being held at an undisclosed location in a swamp along the Chattahoochee River, not far from the Kennedy farm. All white folks are invited to the party, so the announcement issued by the mobs committee of six. As a result, thousands of citizens have been congregating all afternoon at the Kennedy farm. Bonfires have been started, piles of sharp sticks have been prepared, knives have been sharpened, and one woman has displayed a curry comb with which she promises to torture the Negro. The crowd is said to have been addressed by a member of the Florida State Legislature, who, in a humorous vein, promised that no one would be disappointed if the crowd maintained decorum. Some misgivings are said to have been expressed by the committee over the fact that the crowd is heavily armed and highly intoxicated. It is feared that shots aimed at the Negro may go astray and injure innocent bystanders, who include some women with babes in arms. During the early afternoon, a party of men broke off from that crowd at the Kennedy farm and paid a visit to the cabin where Neal's family lives and burned it to the ground. Early announcements of the lynching has had its repercussions outside the community. At Tallahassee, the Florida Council of the Association of Southern Women for the Prevention of Lynching has issued a strong appeal to law enforcement officials to do all within their power to prevent the mob from carrying out its plan. In Washington, the Attorney General of the United States said that he was powerless to invoke the federal kidnapping law to rescue Neal because no ransom was involved. In New York, Walter White, Secretary of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, sent a telegram to Florida's Governor David Schultz, urging him to take immediate steps to protect Neal. J.P. Newell, the Governor's Executive Secretary at Tallahassee, has replied that the Governor is out of the Capitol and cannot be reached. Well, following that, we have from the Birmingham, Alabama Post of October 27, 1934, the headline that lynching carried off almost as advertised did in Mariana, Florida of, on October 27th of the same year, of course. The body of Claude Neal, 23, Negro, confessed attacker and slayer of a white girl, swung from a tree on the courthouse lawn here today, victim of an enraged mob's vengeance. A crowd of 100 men, women, and children silently gazed at the body, nude except for a sack reaching from waist to knee. The Negro had been shot at least 50 times, burned with the red-hot irons, and dragged through the streets behind an automobile. An eyewitness to the lynching, which took place yesterday, said that Neil had been forced to mutilate himself before he died. What follows is rather a graphic description of the events involved, and this not being a video game or a movie, but the real thing, I suspect some of you will not be able to handle it and will try to flag this video. Well, you know, fuck that. I'm just going to read it anyhow. The eyewitness gave the following account of the event which took place in a swamp beside the Chattahoochee River. Due to the large number of people who wanted to lynch the nigger, it was decided to do away with him first and then bring him to the Kennedy house dead. First they cut off his penis. He was made to eat it. Then they cut off his testicles and made him eat them and say he liked it. Then they sliced his sides and stomach with knives, and every now and then somebody would cut off a finger or toe. Red-hot irons were used on the nigger to burn him from top to bottom. From time to time during the torture, a rope would be tied around Neil's neck, and he was pulled up over a limb and held there until he almost choked to death, when he would be let down and the torture began all over again. After several hours of this punishment, they decided just to kill him. Neil's body was tied to a rope on the rear of an automobile and dragged over the highway to the Kennedy home. Here a mob estimated to number somewhere between 3,000 and 7,000 people from 11 southern states was excitedly waiting his arrival. When the car which was dragging Neil's body came in front of the Kennedy home, a man who was riding the rear bumper cut the rope. A woman came out of the Kennedy house and drove a butcher knife into his heart. Then the crowd came by and some kicked him and some drove their cars over him. What remained of the body was brought by the mob to Mariana, where it is now hanging from a tree on the northeast corner of the courthouse square. 
Photographers say they will soon have pictures of this body for sale at 50 cents each. Fingers and toes from Neil's body are freely exhibited on street corners here. Neil is said to have confessed to attacking and killing the white girl when he was first brought to jail for safekeeping. Followed by an item from the New York Post of October 27, 1934. Its headline stating, Father Feels Deprived of Chance to Kill Negro. Also dated Greenwood, Florida on October 27th. A bent little old man today stood on the porch of his simple farm home and said a mob done me wrong because he killed the Negro instead of attacking and killing his 20... accused of attacking and, attacking and killing his 23-year-old daughter after assuring the old man that he would have the first shot. George Kennedy, his red beard belying, but his stooped frame attesting his 60-odd years, wept openly at every mention of my girl as he told how Miss Lola Kennedy, his daughter, left her farm home last week to be killed at a pig pen half a mile away in a cotton patch. Claude Neal, young Negro, who officers said confessed to the killing, was shot many times, his body mutilated with knives and taken to Mariana, the county seat, where it was strung up by the neck from a tree limb in the courthouse square. They'd done me wrong about the killing, said the aged father as he wept. They promised me they would bring him to my house before they killed him and let me have the first shot. That's what I wanted. All right. And thus we see ordinary citizens empowered to defend their rights and enforce the law of the land by their own freeborn hands. Those of you who find my example unfair need to realize that the right to lynch miscreants was considered by your forefathers proof of democratic liberties in action, and that the state had no business getting in the way of the sovereign rights of the people to dispense justice as they saw it. What? Uh, as though you're trying to say that the sovereign people can act as unjust and tyrannical as the state itself? Is that what you're saying this time? Well, uh, boys and girls, of course it is. Uh, states are made by men, and if the states they make can behave unjustly, so can men themselves, all the while sincerely believing their motives are the purest and their righteousness unquestionable. If a state takes over the people's sovereign right to lynch, as did certain regimes in 20th century Europe, uh, this is still the injustice of man himself, with his state being merely the tool. The state, like a garden shovel, has no mind of its own. The character of the user determines whether it digs a garden or a grave. So, while there's plenty of historic evidence that the state has been and continues to be a source of tyranny, there is absolutely none that allows you to believe the opposite. Abolishing the state will not and cannot, in itself, make men wiser, more just, more kind or loving to their neighbor. There is no justification in the human record for such a belief, saying that it's inherently impossible to humanize the state to democratize its functions on behalf of those it governs, all those it governs, not just those of the right class or race or religion or politics, is to say at bottom that it's impossible to humanize or democratize society itself. Is that really want, where you want to go with your argument? Uh, I don't doubt that it is for a good many so-called libertarians. Uh, when I see them allied with some of the most cynical, religious, and political and economic philosophies in the Western world. When the uprisings in Egypt were underway, whole cities of millions of people were under the control of self-governing bodies of citizens, showing that the spirit of ordinary people can indeed rise to the occasion and take over the functions of government and run it just as competently or not. But such revolutionary situations are always transitory. When the dust settles and the blood dries, we find that any large and complex society will need administrative machinery to coordinate its needs and functions, because the spirit always needs a body to realize its desires, its needs, its values. <laughs> Can knock upon the phone. Hello. Who? Clarence Darrow. As one of America's most famous and notorious defense attorneys, you have a few things to say on the individual and the state. What? You just wanted to tell our viewers that the state shouldn't be that sanctuary in society where liberty and justice for all is protected, where all people can freely come to seek justice and find protection for their rights as individuals and as a society. To take this right and give it to private corporate persons as a trust is to buy the lies of the fox and give him the key to the hen house. That each man in human society is free only if all are free. All oh, that's pretty fancy high-flown words, aren't they? I mean, how can I tell them that? They'll just think I'm really talking to Fidel Castro. 